Hello and welcome. This is the Collective Podcast with Rick Miller and Jack Everton. It's just Rick here today. And I'm really, really honoured to be speaking to Professor Orle Johansson, um, who is an absolute expert into the area of EMFs. And we'll be talking about exactly what those are in a few moments time. But just to kind of wet your whistle, as it were, in terms of the amazing credentials and background that Professor Orle has, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview before we uh, say hello to him. So uh, Professor Ole is a world-leading authority in the field of EMFs, uh, radiation and its health effects. Um, among the extensive achievements he's had over his career, he actually coined the term uh, screen dermatitis, which later on, for anybody listening in who's uh, another quantum health practitioner, will be fully aware of the term electrohypersensitivity, but he was the first uh, to actually see a health effect from uh, a true clinical health effect from from exposure to EMFs, um, and he's also, you know, uh, a great professor in uh, adjunct professor, I should say, in basic and clinical neuroscience um, at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And he's published more than eight hundred original articles, reviews, book chapters. He's, he's been present at conferences all over over the world, and he's also been. Uh, a starring role in a number of amazing short documentaries um, on this area of EMF. So, uh, Professor Johansson, welcome. So wonderful <laughs> to, to host you today. How are you? Well, I'm very, very much honoured by the introduction. Thank you so much. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to listen to your questions and the discussion later on. Definitely. And we'll certainly, we uh, just so the listeners are aware, we are going to talk about, um, you know, Professor Jonsson's, you know, independency as a researcher and, and the charitable donations that are required to keep this amazing work going. So I will come back to that a little bit later and explain, you know, if you're passionate about this area, how you can help him continue to do the amazing work that he's doing. So let's let's talk about this. So um, I'm sure uh, most people who are listening into this may have heard the term EMF. Um, at some point, maybe they've seen it on a documentary, maybe they've read something online. Obviously, you're a you're an established professor in this area. What is an EMF? Just for people who are completely uninitiated to this area, in in a, in a nutshell. Yeah, um, that's an abbreviation for the word mm. or term electromagnetic fields, and then we can talk about, for instance, uh, ordinary household electricity which belongs to the so-called extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields. Uh, but we also have radio frequent fields uh, that instead are at a very high frequency and we use it for radio, television, and of course, cell phone communication, as well as uh, wireless laptops uh, and internet communication and so on. And uh, if mm. we continue further up the frequency scale, then we will enter things like heat, visible light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, and eventually so-called alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, which uh, comes from like nuclear power plants, radioisotopes, and atomic bombs. Uh, and finally, we have the cosmic rays emanating, for instance, from stars like the sun. And they all belong to the same frequency scale, but are, of course, very, very different to each other. That's an incredibly vast and yet very, very succinct overview of, 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 this, of this area of um, EMFs. And as I think most people can appreciate at this point, obviously, uh, when they've heard things like telecommunications, Wi-Fi, cell phones, these are all everyday devices and you know, even electricity, let's let's call it the electricity that runs into our house. Uh, one might say that these have been founding principles of, you know, advancing humankind, you know, the ability to turn yeah. on a light switch we've had since the, you know, the, the late 19th century, uh, the ability to make a phone call or to send a radio broadcast has been has been part of the defining works of the 20th century. But I think what's what's interesting, certainly from my own journey into understanding EMFs as, as, as a dietitian and clinician is that I think the there is a lot of mixed understanding around the health effects of EMFs and sadly 
Um, a lot of the information that's out there, certainly when I have did my own research in this area, is not by credentialed individuals like yourself. It's, you know, by people who are, you know, amateurs, perhaps, you know, and researchers, which is fine. But I think it's a bit different when it comes from somebody who's actually done the research in this area. So perhaps we can sort of turn to maybe your your background in this area and how you actually got interested into uh, this area of EMS and how they affect people's health. Well, as you said before, I have a background in basic and applied neuroscience. So I know a little bit about the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves around and in our body. Um, mm. And um, I uh, started to look into human skin after I had presented my doctoral dissertation. And uh, very soon I realized that there were people that claimed various adverse health effects when they were exposed to the newly introduced uh, personal computers and similar mm. gadgets. And now we are at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 80s. And a crucial moment for me was one evening at eight o'clock in the laboratory, someone had left. Uh, a radio on and I was about to just turn it off when I heard mm. a Swedish woman, uh, her name is Kajsa Vedin and she worked in Göteborg on the west coast of Sweden with trade union questions and she was talking about uh, particularly women but also men being affected when they started to use these personal computers and big computer uh, screens and it caught my attention, I can tell you. And it's so odd because had I arrived just a few seconds before, I would have turned it off and then we wouldn't have this conversation. But uh, mm. someone, uh, God, or I don't know who, um, made me slow down a few steps, you know, and I heard her voice. And I immediately decided that, oh, I could help her. She was asking for expertise in clinical neurology. And I'm not a clinical neurologist, but uh, I am, am a neuroscientist. So I thought, well, close enough. So let's meet. <laughs> and so we did. And she brought to Stockholm also a physicist. And we sat down and started to talk. And it was extremely interesting to listen to her experience. Uh, from the ordinary work life around Sweden, where people have claimed these adverse health effects. And we decided to put together a rather big team down in Göteborg on the west coast of Sweden and start investigating persons that initially were called um, uh, electrical allergy persons or patients, mm. and later on screen dermatitis. And further on, they became the functional disability or impairment, electro hypersensitivity. And um, well, the rest is history, as you say, you know. And it turned out to be a both fascinating story, but um, also often quite surprising. It was obvious after some years that society in general, and especially the finance and industrial and political sectors, well, they didn't really want us to investigate this. Uh, and they mm. put obstacles in front of us. And um, around the mid 1990s, it turned out extremely difficult to achieve any grants for research purposes. And as you say, nowadays I'm retired and my workplace was the Karolinska Institute and also the Royal Institute of Technology. Uh, but now I'm retired, so I work both from home, but I also have collaboration with colleagues around the world. And as you said, if anyone would like to support us with a single pound, dollar, ruble, krona, whatever, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, yeah, no, really, because we need the support and uh, we are also very interesting in areas like yourself, what I would call energy or frequency medicine, based mm. upon ideas and hypotheses uh, that we can discuss further later on. Of course, I think uh, uh, it's interesting that you point out, obviously, your 
your prestigious background in neuroscience as a, as a, as a scientist, um, one of the, I, I suppose, pioneering clinicians that really brought to my attention the issues around uh, EMFs was uh, Dr. Jack Cruz, who um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but is a... Oh, yes, uh, yes, yes, I am, yes. Oh, yes, you are. Fantastic. And uh, I think certainly uh, if you've not already, then uh, I think uh, you, would, you guys would have a huge amount to, uh, to talk about um, in terms of your, your research. Um, if I could just quickly, that... oh, please, yeah. quickly touch upon what you just said now, which is very important because I had the great, great honor to work together with scientists that were very, very successful, including mm. Nobel Prize winners. And um, so we used to publish in the field of neuroscience in journals such as Nature, Science, Brain Research, Neuroscience and so on, the top journals in the medical field. And this is very important because when I started to instead investigate persons with in electro hypersensitivity, at first, um, should we call them opponents uh, or people doubting uh, the importance of the research? They tried to claim that I was just an amateur until they mm. saw my CV, my curriculum vitae, and realized that, oh, no, 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 no. He is far, far from that, you know. So that was a very important basis. And I also learned a lot from uh, working together with these very famous professors uh, around the world and at the Karolinska Institute. And uh, it formed like a security for me to always lean against when people try to say that we didn't know our trade, which we definitely did. I think it's really clear, uh, Professor Oleg, you know, just looking through, and again, I, uh, it would take me probably a lifetime to go through all the work that you've, <laughs> that you've written, but, but certainly a large number of hours. But to just even skim uh, researching some of the things that you've looked into, I think it's very clear for any, any academic that you, know, you are very established in this field. But um, I think I just wanted to go back to what you said there about you, you faced some adversity around the research in this area. Again, the interesting thing is that when I started to look into EMFs and, you know, the, the health effects are compelling, you know, as a clinician, you know, when you start to actually delve into it, which we certainly will do, dear listeners, in a, in a moment's time. But the World Health Organization did create a working group to look into this particular field. And if I believe it correctly, it was 1996, they set up the international, I think, uh, EMF for electro, electromagnetic frequencies um, uh, field, sorry, uh, group. Um, and it seems interesting that for a group that's been around for more than 20 years, that there isn't a lot more widespread press around this at all. I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on, on that at all as to why uh, this, hasn't, this message hasn't got any further at all. Um, is it simply that there are competing interests in this area from your perspective? Well, I mean, I don't have a clear answer, but one should remember that members of this group and associated groups have been shown to actually be supported directly by the industry. And mm. of course, then it is more difficult to really trust the outcome. And at the same time, I do hope that everyone at the World Health Organization only um, has uh, the well-being of the world in front of them and as their aim. But as you know from like this pandemic scandal at the World Health Organization, money talks, money speaks, follow the money, all of that, you know, and there is so much politics. And um, I mean, I, I can understand that campaigners and activists and ordinary lay persons they do frown and think what is actually going on. And we see this repeatedly. And here in Sweden, we have excellent digging journalism programs like in the television, in the public TV, and they reveal these scandals every week, more or less. And uh, well, you get tired, to be honest. And uh, I think these issues are far too important, especially when you leave the human 
uh, being um, aside and instead interest yourself in the other 8.7 million species, including animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, etc., which are definitely affected by the artificial electromagnetic fields we are talking about now. Mm -hmm. And one should also not forget that this is one of the very few areas where all the world's uh, insurance and reinsurance companies do not in any form take responsibility for health effects of electromagnetic fields. And if that doesn't speak volumes, then I don't know what. Uh, and I remember yeah. I was in London at the meeting, and that's actually 21 years ago, where uh, people from the insurance and reinsurance industry were there, like from Lloyd's UK, Swiss Rea in Switzerland, if Scandia from Sweden and so on. And they all said, and remember, this is 2002. Already then they said that for them, it was not the question whether these electromagnetic fields and signals were dangerous or not, they knew they were dangerous. The only question for them was who is going to pay for the party in the future when people are starting to see compensation for various damages, illnesses, and harm. Um, so therefore, they said, we will not cover this. And they were never sort of secret about it. That was a public meeting. Uh, it was reported here in Sweden in the public media and so on. But people are occupied with so many other things, you know, it never really uh, grew into people's yeah. mind. And uh, it should have because it's still the same. And of course, mm. the same goes for the manufacturers, uh, for the operators who sell you safe gadgets, but they don't believe it themselves. And therefore, mm. they take no form of responsibility for them. And I say again, you know, money really speaks uh, high volumes when it comes to these decisions. And uh, mm. my sort of contribution is to just put the facts on the table, leaving to politicians and civil servants to decide how should our future world look like. And uh, unfortunately, I must say, I have written many times to different levels of society, including the Swedish former prime minister, he didn't give a toss. Uh, he left the letter to another minister. She didn't give a toss. And she gave it to a civil servant um, at the governmental office who didn't know or understand a thing. And she replied, but it was a reply like Greta Thunberg often says, a blah, blah, blah reply, you know. And it didn't help us at all. So I do hope they are turning away and not regretting it in the future. Mm. And, I, and I, it, it, I know that you've you've written before to even to the UK government as well. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah. yeah and yeah. and I've, I've I've actually seen the the because the, obviously the letter was freely available on online, and you spell out very clearly these health effects, which I promise, uh, listen, we will get into in a second. Uh, but I just wanted to build up the magnitude to which. Professor Ole has gone to. This isn't, uh, you know, a passing interest, and then he's uh, putting out videos online saying, you know, people should do something about this. You've really gone to town to oh, try yeah. and warn governments, institutions, yeah. civil servants, the lot that this is a yeah. huge issue. And I mean, it we have like, for, yeah, we have written to the like United years. Nations. They didn't even reply. Wow. We wrote to the World Health Organization. They didn't reply, and so on. And uh, I mean, they must know something, namely that it is safe. And why can't they share that information with me as a scientist? Mm. Uh, do they think I'm stupid and dumb uh, and wouldn't understand uh, the research data they have? Uh, or are they actually hiding something? Uh, is the truth very different from what they um, uh, um, propel forward in the public uh, arena. And uh, there are questions around this, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. I say again, I do hope that I and all the other scientists are wrong. But then, you know, mm -hmm. it would have to mean that tens of thousands of scientific, peer review based scientific 
publications all must be wrong at the same time. And that has never mm. happened before in human history. So no, 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 something is yeah. fishy. I think you say in 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 the English language, you know. So uh, uh, there's some there are some big. I think another one to use another one, another term. Some big porky pies being told. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. But, That's uh, a good expression. Uh, I like that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, let's turn to then some of these health effects that we've been talking about. So we've set the scene that this is a huge issue. You've been researching it for well over 40 years and you've written to high level governmental institutions. How do these different EMFs affect the human body or what is the proposed mechanisms that have been put in place uh, by the scientific literature? And what's your position on how they actually affect human beings? Well, I mean, if you start with electro hypersensitivity, uh, maybe the first documented case would be the very famous Serbian American inventor and entrepreneur Nikolai Tesla, uh, and oh, wow. um, yeah, and he described the kind of health effects he had, uh, and they sound very much like electro hypersensitivity. And as you know, he was super intelligent and laid the foundation for basically everything that we use today in that particular field, like television, radio, cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, mm. The most famous electro hypersensitive person today is the former medical doctor. She is also the former prime minister of Norway, and she is also the former head of the World Health Organization, Gro Harlem Brundtland, a super mm. intelligent woman, very, very capable. And she has come out in public and talked about her electron hypersensitivity. And when you go to the scientific literature, you would see that, for instance, an electron hypersensitive person would first start to describe sensations from skin and, and the cutaneous level, including pricking pain, heat sensation, feeling of warmth, redness, itch, etc., all of which would mimic very much what you would feel if you spend time out in the sun too long. Um, mm. And uh, But these reports here in Sweden, for instance, they came in the mid of the Swedish very dark winter. There is no sunshine mm. at all, you know. And still people in front of computer screens reported sunburn sensations and even revealed a very strong redness as if they would have been outdoors in the summer, but it, it was in the mm. winter in Stockholm, for instance. And um, then, of mm. course, you have impacts on the immune system. I have written a paper that was published in 2009 about uh, those uh, interactions. And to make a very long story short, it seems as if our immune system initially tries to fight it out. Uh, but after mm. some time, it gives up and deteriorates. And then it seems as we start to leak and only today, heaven knows what that will actually mean in the long term run. Uh, we do see, for instance, dramatic effects on sperm cell count, mutility and um, uh, quality. Uh, and uh, it's so dramatic. So the World Health Organization have convened a um, special meeting about future fertility. And one of the effects that has been documented in several studies is that they don't like cell phone radiation. The mm -hmm. same goes for, uh, and now I will leave the human being for a while, and um, it goes for so-called pollinators like honeybees. They definitely don't like these uh, rays uh, either. And what keeps me very much awake, and now I sort of come back to the human being um, because very few people know that if you count all the cells in your body, all the muscle cells, all the nerve cells, all the blood cells and so on, when you have counted all the cells, somewhere between 50 and 90% of the cells are bacteria. And so mm, um, when I look upon you, I see a big bacterial clump decorated with a head, you can say, you know. Uh, so maybe 50 <laughs> to 90%, yeah, is bacteria. And when they were 
subjected in very nice studies and it has been replicated. Um, uh, they were subjected to old type GSM mobile telephony, what was called the second generation, and also to modern Wi-Fi routers. Um, they became antibiotic resistant. And this was published wow. by American authors in 2017, the very same year, completely independent of each other, the G20 countries had a special meeting in Europe because they had noted that more than 25,000 Europeans died prematurely because of antibiotic resistance in healthcare. And was it last year, I think, when the World Health Organization was asked by a reporter if the COVID-19 pandemic is the worst health threat to mankind, and the person from the World Health Organization said, oh no, 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 that we can easily manage. But the reporter was very smart. So he said, well, what's actually then the worst threat to mankind? And then the guy from the WHO said, well, that's antibiotic resistance in healthcare. Uh, so mm. we are talking about something really scary. And I say again, as a, yeah, as a mental fire brigade soldier, if you can call it like that, I do hope these are false alarms. Because if they are not, while we do this interview, you know, hundreds of millions of people are exposing themselves, their bacteria, others' bacteria, pollinator immune system cells, causing damage, harm, leakage of the blood-brain barrier, damage to the mm. DNA, etc., etc. And no yeah. one seems to bother. Um, it seems to be just a matter of greed and profit, and not so much about protection and safety. No, and it's and it's there's there's a number of things there that you said that I think obviously should be ringing alarm bells to people if they uh, if they haven't. Um, but one of them I want to really want to come back to is this area of um, you know microbial uh, proliferation um, and or anti and also antibiotic resistance as well, which I think is as you say is a, is a huge huge problem. Um, yeah, yeah. But I want to come back to that area in a second. I, I would love if you don't mind, just because there's some of some of the listeners, I'm sure, um, again, who might be practitioners, they're thinking, uh, yes, you've got all these health issues. Yes, you've got all these these effects. And absolutely, I'm sure that, you know, that they're real. But is there an underlying cell mechanism that's affecting affecting cells at a basic level when they're exposed to this level of um, electromagnetic fields um, yeah. and, and RF? What's the proposal? To begin with, yeah, to begin with, one has to remember that the exposure levels compared to natural background into mm. which both you and I were born, uh, they are, and, and I lack a good English word, uh, the increase is astronomical or colossal or biblical. Mm. Uh, just for the mm. third generation mobile telephony, uh, the allowed exposure levels in the UK, as well as here, is a quintillion times above natural background. That's a one with 18 zeros behind. And oh so the exposure levels are more than dramatic. And as you say, from a mechanistic point of view, uh, scientists haven't really seen all the details, but I could just mention the few um, trails that people follow. I mentioned before damage to the DNA molecule mm -hmm. and also alterations of proteins. Uh, that could be a very interesting uh, area to continue investigating. And then, of course, you sort of slide into uh, voltage gate and ion channels, which all cells have, and they mm -hmm. seem to be altered by these exposures, meaning that something good or bad could happen. Uh, I mentioned before with the immune system that initially it seems as if they get the capacity to fight out these exposures, but just for some time. Then they start to deteriorate, yes. and it has been used as a discussion basis 
for the increased sensitivity you see in our society regarding, for instance, allergies, asthmas, other oversensitivities, mm. and the enormous impact of a rather harmless uh, coronavirus. Uh, maybe we were sort of negatively prepared to be affected uh, on a much broader and deeper scale by that. It's a discussion and it's interesting. And then, of course, really? what, what I have done a lot of work on is not so much at the uh, molecular scale, but more the cellular scale. And that's the mast cell um, uh, area where it's obvious that so-called mast cells in our skin, for instance, they do react as if the non-ionizing radiation from a computer screen is actually a, a ionizing radiation, like from plutonium, uranium, radium, or X-rays, and mm. which they are not, of course, but they react in the same way. And I know many... Uh, authors have picked up on this and pointed to that that could be the simple common denominator, the common way that the mast cells initially react, and then they will um, result in a cascade of cellular mm. and molecular events, uh, leading to that you suddenly have problems at hand. Definitely, yes. Unbelievable. I mean, it's it just, yeah, I think like many areas of, of clinical research we don't have all the pieces together yet no but the one yeah. that's, that seemed to kind of fit the bill and definitely flies in the face of some of the stand let's call it standard uh positions on emfs and how they affect health which is as you say is uh that they don't heat the surface of the human body and therefore they're not dangerous and the when you mentioned there about the voltage gated ion channels i think just for the listeners benefit i've for those who don't have a, a medical or technical background, uh, these ion channels are, I can't put it lightly to say that they are incredibly important in many cellular and intracellular functions. And for those of you who listen to our podcast regularly, you'll know that we are very, very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, expressive about our views on the mitochondria and how important the mitochondria are for various different functions throughout the body. Most people only know the mitochondria for generating ATP and being like cell batteries, but actually they have a plethora of different functions um, at an intracellular level. And I guess when these voltage-gated channels are activated in the presence of VMF, you've got a flood of ions going into the cell like calcium, uh, which shouldn't be going in basically at that time True. and when yeah. you have too much yeah when you have too much calcium coming into something like the mitochondria it seems to be from the literature that you can set off this kind of i think what they termed is excitotoxicity or where there's a, a, a massive amount of stress applied in in terms of oxidation uh, within yeah. the mitochondria and we know that that oxidative reductive balance is so important um, in terms of cellular signaling and what people, I guess, might term inflammation or chaos at a mitochondrial level. Um, so that seems to be really convincing to my mind not to expose yourself to EMF at a basic level. But one of the other things that I saw that was very interesting as well is the work of uh, Paul Martin, um, who's uh, published something in 2015. And he was looking, I think, in, in rat models at uh, cortisol uh, release um, after exposure, or at least um, uh, uh, ad adrenocorticotrophin um, uh, activation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and that would leading to cortisol release. And just by exposing these animals to uh, EMF, you could get an increase in cortisol. So there's clearly a stress response going on. But what's more Absolutely. scary to me, yeah, what's more scary, yeah, is is not this, as you say, acute release. It's the chronic exposure because yeah, let's yeah. be honest, nobody nobody these days turns on their phone like we used to, you know, and then the, you put it in a drawer and turn it off when you don't need it. They're on all the time. Uh, yeah. People have got Wi-Fi next to their bed. They've got phones next to their head. They've got smart devices. They've got Bluetooth, you know, um, devices. They are bathed in EMF all day long. Yeah. And so I guess on a basic level, to my mind, given the... The, the damage that excessive cortisol uh, 
can do to the body obviously it's a vital it's a vital uh, uh, a compound that we produce obviously itself it's uh, survival recognizing but in too much i mean it's a huge amount of damage uh, that yeah. can cause yeah no i agree uh, fully you know and uh, don't forget even if you wouldn't own a single device you are still uh, bathe in all these electromagnetic signals because your neighbors and uh, society have them everywhere yeah. Uh, so yes. you cannot get away. There is no place to hide, people uh, often say, you know. And that's so very true. If you don't live deep down in an unelectrified, uh, abandoned coal mine or something, yeah, then possibly, or very, very far out on the Russian tundra, or deep into some forest where you don't have any electricity or any wireless telecommunication. But of course, you cannot live there because you don't have any infrastructure. You don't have a petrol station, not the post office, not the food store, nothing. So it's completely yeah. impractical to even think about living there. But that would be the way to avoid these constant whole body 24-7 exposure. And at levels that even us that are investigating it, it's difficult to really understand what it means to go from one level called the natural exposure mm. up to like a quintillion or more of a certain signal. Um, it's okay. very difficult to really see what that will mean in the long-term run. And it's interesting with the persons with electron hypersensitivity because they actually show a natural avoidance reaction to a toxic environment or should we say a potentially toxic environment. And therefore I have started since a few years back to rename them. They are for me the new normal and people that are not electro hypersensitive, <laughs> I call them electro hypo sensitive because they mm. don't react to the ambient uh, fields that the electro hypersensitive people do. So maybe, mm the winners at the end will be the electro hypersensitive people not buying and using all these gadgets as will people in countries that are very, very poor. They cannot build this infrastructure and they cannot buy computers, laptops, tablets, cell phones, smartphones, and so on. And maybe that will actually turn out to be good for them. Uh, and uh, maybe finally the real winners will be, for instance, and um, both people as well as um, animals living very deep into jungles and uh, far away on the Icelandic uh, uh, um, tundras and so on, you know, uh, because again, Absolutely. they will not be exposed at all. And you also mentioned rightfully that you have an influx of calcium, but don't forget also that if you manipulate these ionic channels, you may very easily have an efflux of a lot of different uh, 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 molecules, actually, not only ions. You can have a leakage of other substances. And that was shown many, many years ago. And for me, that was actually the start already in 1977. So you were not even born then, you know. And, no, and uh, no. <laughs> no, right. And, and then I saw that the scientists have investigated the very famous so-called blood-brain barrier, and mm. they shown had shown that it started to leak when they exposed it to microwaves. And initially, the scientists felt, wow, this is fantastic. This is a non-invasive tool, so we can study the blood-brain barrier. And no one understood oh, that wow. the entire world would go microwave-based. So... The question today is, are we all leaking? Is that the reason for various things we see in society? And there are other such barriers. A, a very famous one is, of course, the blood testis barrier uh, in men. And that could explain why you see this dramatic decline in sperm cell quality, motility, morphology, count, and so on. Uh, even jeopardizing mm -hmm. future human fertility. And now also being reported from England 
Uh, for dogs, for instance, similar reductions. Uh, so, oh, you know, I, I sometimes I, I sleep badly, to be honest, uh, because yeah. I, I cannot help thinking about, do we actually know what we are doing to all the species? Well, the telecom manufacturers, operators, the insurance and reinsurance companies definitely know what they're doing because they say, no, we will not take any responsibility for this safe technique, you know. Uh, so they have more information that maybe you and I even have, you know. That's, it is, as you say, it's almost like a snowball effect because oh, when yeah. you start to understand these these uh, underlying mechanisms, even at a very basic level, you realize that the the possibilities for different conditions ranging from, as you say, headaches or maybe, as you say, topical problems like skin outbreaks or rashes, all the way up to potentially very serious autoimmune conditions, as you're saying. You know, we've got a plethora and an and, and, and exponential growth of autoimmune-related conditions that are, just appear to be going out of control and these yeah, you know, yeah. virtually didn't exist. And many of the pundits, I would say, or the food gurus around, you know, including, you know, dietitians like myself, would happily say, oh, well, it's to do with the diet, it's to do with our exercise. But no one's looking to the other exponential change, which has been the use of, you know, electronic devices like mobile phones, ta tablets, you know, Wi-Fi. No one's even considered that when actually no. there's clear underpinning mechanisms. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to... Um, to touch a little could, bit could I just say that oh. um, you know don't get me wrong I mean there are a lot of very very important so-called confounders and uh, it mm, could be as you say the diet uh, your habits your lifestyle the lack of mm. exercise or whatever and we try to take them into account and in so-called control experiments we try to keep them under uh, control all the time and when we do, we still see these dramatic effects of the electromagnetic fields. Uh, so they mm -hmm. are important indeed. Yes, they are. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to dwell for a second, just because it's quite nouveau and, uh, and trendy, I would say at the moment, even as a health trend. Even as a dietitian, since I've been practicing, you know, the, the incidence of so-called, you know, functional gut problems have, have exploded. And our understanding of obviously the human microbiome, which we alluded to, the effects the EMFs might have on microbe uh, growth and diversity uh, a few moments ago. We, there is also this term around sort of leaky gut syndrome. And that has, I think, as, as you say, gone further to, you know, maybe leaky brain syndrome. And I certainly, uh, when I was speaking to uh, uh, Ryan Porter about uh, the health of the skin uh, recently, and we talked about. Um, uh, the importance of maintaining good skin integrity for a number of different factors, not just obviously from sun uh, exposure and protection, but also as, as an organ, as a as bona fide endocrine organ itself, producing many different compounds which are vital to our, uh, our health. But there is also a term called leaky skin as well, which might also underpin some of these uh, uh, rashes that people experience and, and hence why topical care is good. Do you think, it, just postulating here from your professional perspective that if somebody has as you say like a functional gut disorder like irritable bowel syndrome uh, like con functional constipation diarrhea something like this which we know potentially have links to the gut microbiome if they're prolific users of technology have a let's call it a dysfunctional relationship with exposure to EMF. They don't take any mitigation steps to avoid it, which we will hopefully we'll talk about in a few seconds time. Do you think that that potentially might worsen their symptoms or at least um, have some sort of effect on it? Or do you think that oh, the two are quite, quite different? Yeah, no, definitely. There are even already publications. I looked at them, uh, I think, was it yesterday even? Uh, so you are completely right. Yes, uh, they will affect uh, the gut at different levels. And again, mm. you know, it kind of ties together. And maybe the common denominator would be, as we talked about before, effects of the electromagnetic fields on the ionic channels of different types 
uh, not only calcium uh, voltage gated channels, but it could be others as well. Uh, and that could be extremely important to try to investigate. And what we tried to do many years ago was actually uh, to take a Swedish small town called Jungby in the part of Sweden called Småland. And we said that we wanted to strip them of everything uh, when it comes to electromagnetic fields. No radio, no television, no <laughs> cell phones, nothing. And you oh, like a year or two just monitor whether normal healthy Swedes actually slowly or rapidly would become more healthy. Uh, and that ties very well into your question, uh, not only for patient categories, but for everyone living under this constant bombardment, this colossal bombardment. Uh, but we were turned down. Uh, and the reason was that it was, and I quote, unethical to do this kind of a study. And oh. I don't understand that. We wanted no, to no. increase public health. How can that be unethical? Uh, I just don't understand. But I guess it was about greed and profit rather than human need. Uh, and therefore, we could never start it. But it's still... On our agenda, we would like to do such a study uh, to see if you can actually positively uh, affect and increase health quality. And um, we have done quite a lot of register studies here in Sweden, uh, trying to build a basis from which we can see. Uh, and there are so many aspects here, you know, when it comes to, for instance, mast cell behavior, histamine release, allergies, asthmas, and so on, where during the last decades, the normal baseline has had to be shifted upwards because if they don't, then 100% of Swedes would be allergic. And you cannot have that. Oh. That's bad PR for Sweden, you know. So you change in the registers, and suddenly when we look into it, we see that, what? What has happened? Suddenly, another level is the new normal. And uh, so I would say there is not only fake news, but fake actions here trying to save face, maybe. I don't know what it is. Uh, and mm. it's um, in the longer run quite scary, actually, because uh, I say again, if you use the baselines that were set down in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, then suddenly everyone is ill. So mm -hmm, absolutely, something and I, has and happened. Talk. And if it's lack of exercise, bad food, or electromagnetic fields, you and I, we can investigate that if we are given the proper resources. Absolutely, absolutely. I think with all these things, uh, more research often is is needed, and it's there's a, there's a relentless pursuit to understand this in better detail. But as you say, if there are uh, let's call it nonsense reasons for uh, government research uh, funding groups to not provide adequate resources to to find out the research, I think then we are we are hamstrung from the start. Uh, and you I, know that's that's really one of my big surprises or revelations in my life that society introduces safe technologies but it's not safe for Ole Johansson to investigate their safety it's what? it's a very backwards way to go about <laughs> yeah. it isn't it that's and, very odd and, you know absolutely i um i would love to get into some of the basic mitigation steps that somebody could do if they're concerned about it. And certainly I'm going to explain some of the things that I've done as a practitioner because I am concerned about it. I am a pair, uh, a father myself. I have two beautiful children and I take active steps to reduce their exposure, knowing that because they're at school, sadly, the, the movement now is towards paperless. Um, every child has access to a tablet, which is obviously connected to the internet. A lot of the social time that children have is now online. And they're exposed to the different uh, electromagnetic um, fields all the time. But um, I would love to just get from your perspective. Obviously, if somebody is bathed in EMF all day long, 
And it's because of these different fields that they're being exposed to, which are non-native in nature. They're artificial. They're, they've been created by man. If you were to do some of the typical, what we would call, I guess, quantum or environmental uh, mitigation steps, so things like grounding, for instance, getting yourself in magnetically connected to the earth again through touching the earth's surface or uh, something else, for instance, do you think that those sorts of things are effective? Um, is there any science that suggests that, you know, for instance, standing, you know, on your lawn whilst using a device might mean it's you're more protected from it? Uh, to stand on your lawn and uh, use a gadget? Yeah. No, I wouldn't say that makes any real difference. Yeah. But at the same time, I have been in California, in San Francisco in 2009, and I met a fantastic scientist, Clint Ober, who has written a lot about yes, grounding. Know him. Yeah, and yes. uh, that was very, very fascinating. But of course, from a mitigation point of view, there are only two means, often in combination, that we can use. And I would summarize them as shielding and distance uh, to mm -hmm. get yourself and your family away from and or also shield off. And for the school you mentioned just a few weeks ago, and it has nothing to do with the electromagnetic fields, but the behavioral impacts, uh, the United Nations organ called UNESCO has come forward and recommends all the UN countries to remove all these gadgets from the schools. So, but oh, wow. that's from a learning, attention, behavioral point of view. But of course, you would then get rid of all these um, electromagnetic field emitters that we call laptops, yes. cell phones, and so on. So there are things happening. And unfortunately, still, I would say a recommendation from UNESCO, which is a very important UN organ for children, doesn't really reach uh, school authorities here in Sweden, for instance, uh, parents, teachers, headmasters, yet. But there are discussions and, you know, um, only you know who I am, actually, you know. People never know who I am. So I always take the opportunity to educate and inform. So when I see like a father or a mother or a grandmother or grandfather, I always lean forward and tell them things. And, and I hope that will initiate free thinking and contemplation, and they will start realizing that there are other ways and the kids might gain tremendously just by focusing on the teacher, on their books and so on, instead of fiddling around with all these electronics all the time. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, then you would also gain uh, the exposure part by just not having the gadgets indoors at all. And there is a country that has used this strategy for quite a few years. Uh, and that's a country who wants to buy you and me. And they want to buy it all, actually. And that's China. And they don't allow kids in schools to bring any gadgets into the school or classroom because they want their kids to listen to the teacher because they should then become super smart pupils and students taking all of the world from us, you know, and, and that's a very good uh, strategy. And I don't mind, you know, I mean, things change, but uh, uh, I think we have to realize that maybe we soon will be small Chinese citizens, all of us, if we don't mimic what they do and try to help our own kids uh, to become the best students yeah. and best pupils uh, and that they can Quite. compete on a global market you know agreed i think um you know it, it's been well um documented as you say that um the uh, the kind of addictive qualities of these different devices uh, for a number of different mechanisms everything from the uh, the, the the light color that's used pre uh, predominantly in in screens uh, yeah. to the uh, the way that the different apps engage the mind and release dopamine that yeah. it's absolutely of, of, of to, to every parent who's listening in to their best interest to limit their children's exposure to these devices which i think most parents hopefully um 
uh, understand that. I guess yeah. the if, uh, I, if the, I may, the, the, if I may just add a short story, I think it was like yeah. two years ago. I went with a commuter train here in Stockholm. And uh, next to me was a very posh lady in her 60s. And she was fiddling around with her smartphone. And I leaned forward. And she didn't know who I was, of course not. And I said, do you know that the World Health Organization in Geneva in Switzerland has cancer classified the electromagnetic signals that you use for your smartphone to communicate? And she went ballistic and told me to go to a very hot place, mind my own business. And I didn't know what I was talking about. And I said, please, 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 you have a smartphone. Stop. Couldn't you please Google WHO brain tumor and cell phone? Just just for me. And she did. And she went silent for like a minute or two. The train was progressing through the landscape. And then she slowly looked up at me and said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, sir. It, it, it's all here. You are, you are completely right. And now I get very, very angry again. Not that you, she said, but that my own government, parliament and health authorities, why have they not informed me about this? You see, mm. I'm not only a mother, I'm also a grandmother. And a week ago, I gave my granddaughter a new cell phone. And now I regret it, she said. Yeah, and, I like it. And then, yeah, then I, I like had it. to leave the train, so I don't know how it ended. Uh, but, um, I mean, your viewers and listeners, what they also can do is to inform and educate it and allow people to think freely for themselves uh, and uh, to make decisions and check out. Uh, this Uli Johansson, he mentioned UNESCO. Was that true, really? Check the internet, read for yourself the official documents and realize that, wow, something is happening here, you know. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, just to, to coin again, Dr. Cruz again, um, who, uh, you know, we, we greatly uh, admire as well as you, as yourself as these kind of founding clinicians in these, uh, the, this area of quantum health, you know, you've got to challenge the centralized dogma because oh, yeah. at the end of the day, you're going to, yeah. you're going to fall prey otherwise. And I think, it's interesting that for many uh, patients and individuals like yourself that I've spoken to about, uh, you know, differences in diet or differences in supplementation or, or lifestyle, most people are happy to accept those sorts of things. But I, I draw back to your reaction of this lady and how um, horrified it sounds like yeah. and quite, yeah. quite, quite angry she was to be yeah. told that the device she's holding in her hand could actually be carcinogenic in some yeah. ways, which is yeah. which is frightening because I think to myself, no, in no other place as a parent or as a grandparent or whatever, would you ever, ever dream of exposing your loved ones and your siblings to something that's potentially carcinogenic, you know, like formaldehyde no. or, yeah. or, you know, hopefully nowadays not cigarette smoke or at least you'd go somewhere else and smoke or exhaust fumes. Um, you would be thinking all the time, my goodness, I want to do everything to avoid that. But when it comes to technology, there seems to be a bit of a, uh, a kind of a, a cognitive dissonance around uh, or an ignorance around this because because it's so ingrained in our everyday lives. Uh, you know, it's 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 very difficult for people to accept this, even when, as you say, you give them the, the scientific literature. Yeah. So I guess but, you know, come back to... Oh, God, but sorry. could I just add that when of I course. give lectures... I often ask the audience, um, do you want to have a brain tumor from your cell phone? No, 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 no. They say, you know, of course not, you know. And, and then I ask them, do you want to have a headache from your cell phone? No one has ever said, yes, that's what I want. Not even mm-hmm. representatives of the telecom industry. Everyone goes, no, no, I don't want that. But actually, that's what many people report. Uh, Mm -hmm. And also what you said is very important, you know, that for, for instance, an electrohypersensitive person uh, to shield and move away is crucial. 
But that is also very important to change all your lifestyle parameters. If you're eating badly, if you're smoking, using drugs, medicines, and so on, not exercising, you have to change it as well. And I remember mm. particularly a lady who called me and she sounded very happy in the phone. And she said that she had become electro hypersensitive. And that was the best thing that had ever happened to her. And I was bewildered, you know, I thought, no, she must be out of her mind. What does she mean? But then she explained that she had left her old life, not her husband and kids. They were still there, but they had moved out in the countryside. She had bought the two dogs she always wanted to have. She had started to do a lot of exercise together with her husband. And also she had entered different art schools. She had also dreamt about, but she never did it when she lived in the modern type life she had lived before. So she said that was really, really a positive liberator being electro hypersensitive. And I said, wow, I mean, I have heard similar stories for other illnesses that have struck people but they have been able to come out on a positive note. Uh, so okay. don't look upon everything as negative. And I say again, the electron hypersensitive people, they are the new normals. And people like myself, we are electro hyposensitive because we okay. don't react. Or at least we don't understand that we react. I haven't counted my sperm cells. I haven't checked my blood brain barrier. I haven't looked into my immune competent cells, the ionic channels or anything. I don't know what's going on in my body, body right now, you know. So maybe I, I am at jeopardy, yeah. you know. Yes. And I, and I, and I think it's, it's, it's amazing that you mentioned that point. And, I, and I, it's almost like kindred spirits, I think, thinking the same thing. But as, as human beings, we are very good, at obviously, at adapting to uh, a given uh, stimulus or exposure uh, and i know that having looked at some of the literature around uh, you know some of these uh, strategies to try and limit the exposure of human beings to ems i think some of them were done with military personnel who were exposed to it 24 hours a day um, those individuals whilst they reported symptoms they had become accustomed to them and so it's not as if like these symptoms necessarily are so stark that you immediately would rush to the doctor. It, no. it seems to be an, but perhaps perhaps insidious, perhaps builds up over time, and also might be operating through multiple different mechanisms. Because yes. when I looked into the, this this brain cancer and, and other cancers link, obviously the uh, the the international bodies uh, looking into this would um, I would give you, I would say give you reassurance. Let's say um, he says slightly uh, sarcastically that there's nothing to be worried about and that there's there's been no increase in the uh, incidence of uh, uh, gliomas or other forms of cancer since we've introduced this technology um, my uh, skeptical side of me that that comes out and says that is that as you say just because there's been no in, in, in incredible increase that doesn't mean that there are not processes going on here that um, clearly could be could be cancerous, and yet in some individuals doesn't progress to full blown brain cancer. Perhaps it, yeah. it manifests as something else. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that at all. Well, I would agree to one hundred percent that there are no statistically significant reported increases in these type of brain tumors today. But mm. if you call me in a hundred years' time maybe the story will sound differently then. And Agreed. at the Agreed. same time, you know, like the more than 90% loss of pollinators like honeybees around the world, well, that would kill us anyhow, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. There, yeah, there are things going on that could be much more acute and rapid. And I think we need to get our politicians, civil servants, and finance elite, uh, industrial elite, so on their uh, toes, really, and try to start investigating this. Uh, and also with the aim, I mean, to come up with alternative technologies. Uh, and I would love, of course, Sweden to do that, because if we could sell all the cell phones, all the laptops, all the power lines, and so once again, but in a human and environmental-friendly format, 
we would be richer than Japan ever was. And talking about uh, money, I forgot to say before that one of many companies around the world uh, that sell different uh, mitigating um, systems, including uh, wall paint, um, uh, canopies for your bed, um, uh, different form of clothing and so on, is Swiss Shield. Uh, Swiss Shield, I think at one word, Swiss Shield. Uh, and mm. uh, they have a website you can look into. And I'm sure you have local representatives in the UK, as yes. we have in Sweden. Uh, we have a fantastic company here uh, where you even can rent or borrow different things to try them out and mm. see if they're for you or not. Uh, so there are quite a lot to be done. Uh, while we are waiting for and I quote, the safe gadgets to appear, uh, gadgets that the insurance companies can take responsibility for. Mm, exactly, exactly. Um, there are definitely lots of different companies and I really want to touch on maybe one or two of them in a, in a moment's time, in the time we've got remaining. Thank you so much, Professor, for uh, your, your valuable time in this discussion. The um, you mentioned a few moments ago around how we can actually mitigate our the effects of EMFs, and really, it's down to getting distance from the the the, the thing itself, whether that's a, an electric and magnetic field that's coming from your plug socket or a device that's plugged into it, or a router, a Wi-Fi router, or a phone, or some other device that's emitting, you know, radio frequencies, for instance. Um, that's all well and good, I think, and I think that's. Most people, I think, listening in would probably concur with that. You know, turn the device off or get distance from it. You're going to start to reduce the exposure effects. Um, but in terms of um, other strategies that might be in place, you mentioned they're about kind of shielding. And I think for the people who, again, who are a little bit skeptical or don't understand what, what that does, perhaps we could talk about, you know, these, these, these different uh materials let's say that are used in these products and how they might shield you from the effects of emf you know uh, for instance uh, you're absolutely right you can get canopies and you can get paint to cover your house with um before people go out and buy a bucket of it it would be great if we explained you know how they actually work to protect you from some of these frequencies well all of them that are professional and working will build what we call a faraday cage around mm. you uh, and you need to for instance shield your ceiling the walls the floor everything and it's rather tricky and therefore it's always recommended that either yourself or you have a consultant with a measuring device you can double check so you don't suddenly have leakages for instance uh, and uh, there are quite a number of stories where people have spent a lot of money but failed mm -hmm. because they forgot you know to for instance shield off the windows uh, so you need to be uh, very accurate when it comes down to these different methods. And, but they're based on the same technology. And unfortunately, I have to say openly and honestly that different pyramids, crystals, pendulums, stickers and so on that are sold on the Internet, they don't work. If you find one of them, please send it to me. Uh, I would be extremely interested, but uh, send it together with peer review based scientific documentation as well as independent replication of other scientists proving the gadget to work. And so far, I have only come across, I would say, three products. And they are based on school book physics, not on any flimsy snake oil uh, dreams, you know. Uh, so <laughs> only, for, yeah, no, really. Uh, and and I think it's uh, very unethical to uh, strip people of money and give them a false sense of security when it just doesn't work. I agree. I, I liken some of these products actually to... Um... Uh, again, this might be a controversial statement, but it's a sun, sun cream because obviously uh, there is a, uh, you know, maybe a falsehood around using uh, something like that to 
uh, completely eliminate the exposure to ultraviolet B radiation, which we need, um, in, at least in certain amounts, to generate vitamin D on our body. And I think that um, when you slap a sticker on your mobile phone, just in the same way if you slap on tons of sun cream, you're likely to either be out in the sun all day long, which is not the way that human beings ever would have done that. They would have seen the erythema and then gone into the shade, or just like an animal does, gets too hot and it goes in the shade. Um, or, as you say, with the uh, EMF protection stickers or whatever they are, or wands, etc., you're then going to use your device freely. And yeah. it, if it's not working, then you're just exposing yourself to potentially yeah. even more radiation, maybe yeah. use it even more than before, thinking that you're you're protected. So um, certainly from my perspective, having taken steps to try and protect my family against EMF, um, and I think I've done it in quite a sort of moderated way. I haven't gone to the extent of painting my house yet in um, in EMF paint, but I did go to the extent of purchasing a um, an EMF uh, monitoring device, uh, a tricord monitor, which I understand is not the industry uh, best. Uh, but I'm not a professional in this field. I just want, I was just curious as to the fields that were generated in my house, and I did absolutely concur that, for instance, with the Wi-Fi router simply doing something basic like getting distance from it after about two meters the rf reading which is the radio frequency reading that's coming from the wi-fi for those of you who've lost track um started to go to very low background range and so that that was quite reassuring what was interesting was uh things like uh the electromagnetic fields that were generated by for instance benign objects like the oven or the the fridge and uh you know the uh the fan that's being operated, you know, to keep us cool in the heat. And all these things, I think, over time, I think it's it's about being mindful that if you can turn it off and not use it and unplug it, it might, ha it might add, up, add, add up over time. And then if you combine it with maybe some of these other quantum in, uh, environmental uh, steps, like the grounding, uh, getting adequate, safe sun exposure to uh, re- uh, stimulate mitochondrial activity, get melanin uh, production going up, which we know is a potent antioxidant carrier in the body. Um, drink, you know, clean water that's not got, um, you know, uh, chemicals in it or, or other damaging things. Eat a, a diet that's healthy. You may well be able to rebuffer against some of these effects because, as you say, as a society, you cannot avoid it. You know, unless you live in the wilderness, um, it's, it's it's utterly impossible. So you have to just take steps to, yeah. to combat it. That's all. I, I agree. And of course, um, your Wi-Fi router, um, it's reassuring that you measured lower and lower field and, and signals from it. But uh, don't forget that the aliens at the other side of the universe can easily monitor it as we monitor radio signals that are billions of light years away. Uh, so yes. it's just a matter of technique and an antenna and sensitivity. Uh, so don't think for a minute that it's enough to go down mm. on such a simple meter. But as you say, it's a surprising system. Uh, you suddenly realize that there are a lot of emitters in your house which you didn't think about. And one thing that has come to my mind the last months uh, are all the so-called Bluetooth-enabled gadgets. And, you know, like in a home or in a workplace, there are like thousands of them everywhere, you know, everything, yes. even things you don't even think about, like your watch, your pulsometer yes. and so on, they are enabled to uh, communicate using Bluetooth and they are constantly saying, hey, hey, we are Absolutely. here, we are here, we are here. Yeah. And that will impact yeah. your body all the time, you know. And that I was understand. fascinating. And, and I did a measurement here where I live. And this is a eight story apartment building with 60 apartments. And there are easily more than 500 such signals just here because they are everywhere. And I don't even own such Bluetooth enabled gadgets, you know, but they're coming through the walls and hammering yeah. all the time. So I hope it's safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. One, one, and and one could I just come back phrase. for a second to, you know, the aliens? Um, sometimes when I look up on the night, sky here in Stockholm I'm very interested in 
planets. Uh, so I look at Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, the moon and so on. It's very nice. And here in Sweden, it's generally very dark, you know, it's easy to see. Um, and then I can't help thinking that we invent all these wireless gadgets and radio and television and blah, 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 all of that. And they are traveling out into space, revealing our existence to the meat eating aliens <laughs> that are looking for food. Yeah, uh, maybe. Are we are we daft or are we dumb? <laughs> I, I I don't know one for one for another day, but it's a very it's a very good point. And again, it, it re, you know as you say re reemphasizes this point that uh, these artificial uh, frequencies that we're putting out into the environment are so wise they're literally touching maybe the corners of the universe. Um, yeah, which yeah. Is, which is um which is and, which and is you quite scary that, and, and profound. Yeah. Thought. Yeah, and you remember that television producers, they always point to you that the very popular uh, Lucy show in the American television, I think it was like in the 40s and 50s, the electromagnetic rays or fields or waves, they are traveling through space. So if you have a television receiver, I think now it's like 80 uh, light years out, then you can watch the episodes again. Uh, because they are traveling infinitely out into space as we are mm -hmm. receiving signals from uh, quasars, from the microwave background, from Big Bang and all of that, you know. And I mm -hmm. say again, please, you meat eaters, I hope some of you are vegetarians. <laughs> 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 and also what Somebody, you said so before is very important that I would say it's not only the quality of food, which is super important, but the quantity. I see in Sweden, people eat a little bit too much. It's good food. Mm. It's very high on nutrients and, and so on, but it's a bit too much, gaining weight. And I will not lean the camera down because I need to lose weight as well, you know, so... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's 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 all it's all good food for thought as they as they say. Yeah. Um Professor Oliver, this has been such an amazing discussion. I really just wanted to, to bring it to a close by talking about uh your your research funding and and the page that uh, we're going to share afterwards uh with all those listeners who want to continue to support you um in this amazing journey that you've spent a lifetime doing. So um we will we will do that. But is there any kind of uh uh, words that you wanted to say to the audience about the uh, the research and we will put a link well, to uh, I would suggest page. that people look into it and there is a short summarizing list of the different projects mm. and remember that we have a few others as well that we haven't enlisted yet on that page and uh, there are two options either via PayPal or direct bank transfer and I repeat myself by saying a single pound will make a difference. And of course, if you have a billion pounds, that's even better, you know. So <laughs> absolutely. So everybody be, you know, think, think, think deeply and think generously as well, uh, because it, well, it may you. not affect necessarily yeah. in your not your lifetime, but maybe your grandchildren's and depending yeah, yeah. on the the effects yeah. of this. Uh, and and that's so, thank also you so much, fair. Professor. Yeah, that's also a very fair point. And um, when I look at small children around me in Stockholm, I often feel that I have a question to myself. Do we really know what we are doing to them? And the answer is, of mm. course, no. We don't have the oversight any longer. The society is so very complicated and complex, and the interactions are astronomically many. And somewhere we might have done a foolish choice. It could be electromagnetic field exposure, chemicals or something else. Uh, and that could jeopardize the future, not only of humans, but of life on this planet, you know. It's a, it's a harrowing, harrowing thought. Thank you so much, Professor. Well, it's been amazing the same. Thank to, you to very much. You.